let's get started with our class. We are in the, uh, actually, we're in the ninth chapter, which is going to be factors that detract from Zerizus. And Zerizus is what did we determine was the, a decent English word for Zerizus? Zeal. Yeah, and it's, and the thing is, is what's bad about this is that, and Rabbi uh, David Katz pointed this out to me the other day, is really Zerizus and Zerus make up zeal. This kind of zeal. If you want to know the Hebrew word for Zerizus, it's not just the English zeal, but it's zeal with a high quality attention to detail. Right? You know what you're doing. Now, let's go back to chapter 8 just briefly, and I want to uh, re uh, recap chapter 8. Uh, Ira Michelson did that chapter last week. We're going to start here, chapter 8, the summary. The methods of acquiring Zerizus correspond to the methods of acquiring Zeri, uh, Zeri, Zerirus. In addition, contemplating Hashem's benevolence or loving kindness, has, uh, Chesed, and how one it depends upon him strengthens one's motivation to serve him with Zerizus. The various levels of contemplation described in chapter 4 as means of motivation of Zeri, Zeri, Zerius. For different classes of people motivate, uh, pe provide motivation for Zerizus as well as for their prospective class. So what did we learn? What is the the idea is a person, depending on who they're at and where, what their level is, all of our zeal is really boils down to one thing. How well connected am I to Hashem and how much do I really love Him? I mean, we do what we like. If you don't like something, you don't do it, period, right? Uh, if a person is a, a strong athlete, they do what they like. They love to work out. I don't... I don't work out because I don't like it. All right. So bottom line, that is how it is. So how well, how is how do we uh, develop Zeri Zeus in our life? Is is having a loving uh, what do you call it? Desire, a great desire to love Hashem and to realize that He is the source of all of of our life. The prayer that you pointed out to me earlier. Uh, at the bottom of it, could you could could you um, find it for me? There is a, a prayer that we we have in the back that people can uh, do special prayers for. And if you wouldn't mind handing that to me, I would greatly appreciate it once she finds it. Um, there we go. This this last line of the prayer. Uh, it is uh, the prayer for thanks to Hashem. At the end, it says, "I am dust and ashes." And you are the entire universe. That's the sum. Now, this is not speaking just that our body go to dust, because what really makes us, and very good point, what makes us is not our body, but our neshama, our soul, right? But compared to the fact that Hashem is the universe, I mean, we talk about all the great expanses of the universe. Mm -hmm. That is Hashem. He is the universe. He is everything. Compared to that, we're just dust and ashes. We're like little molecules, little ones. But he knows us intimately and cares for us, and he shows loving kindness to us. But a person who develops this Zerizus corresponds with the methods of requiring Zerus. So the whole idea is our, 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 our attention to detail, our watchfulness, corresponds to our zeal. With the both of them, that those stay balanced in your life when you love Hashem and you connect to Him. Now, let's go to the, chapter 9. Let's look at the factors that detract. The factors that detract from Zerizus and how to avoid them. The factors that detract from Zerizus are the very same factors that increase laziness and uh, inaction. The greatest of them all is the desire for physical relax relaxation. That's me. I like physical relaxation, don't you? Don't we all? Especially you work a 12-hour shift chasing a one-year-old with medical problems. So, right? You, you want relaxation. The love of physical delights 
enjoyed to their fullest degree. One who is focused on such physical comforts cannot attain Zerizus, for with great uh, with regard to such a person, it is certain that the service of his creator will weigh upon him as a great burden. So the idea is this, is a person who is uh, lazy. Have you heard the statement, I'm not lazy, I'm just tired all the time. <laughs> right? My dad used to say that to me. You're not lazy, you're just tired all the time. Right, son? The idea is, is, is really is not about, uh, it's not a negative not toward relaxation and rest, okay? We're not saying that. What we're saying is a person who is obsessed with their own comfort. They don't want to get out of their comfort zone. They're comfortable where they're at. They don't, don't, I'm just, I just, I like this place. I have this place. This is where I'm at. Don't anybody move me out. And, you know, bless God, hopefully he'll never ask me to get out of my comfort zone. So the idea is that one who has is he's in love with his physical affairs, loves taking care of himself, right? He only thinks or she only thinks about him herself or himself. That's it. So that person, the very idea of studying Torah, the very idea of doing mitzvah, the very idea of doing tzedakah is a burden. It's just way too much, more than they can handle. They're just they're, they end up developing this attitude. God is really, really privileged to have me as his creation, right? It's a total backwards thinking of things, right? This is because someone who wishes to eat his meals with absolute peace in mind and relaxation and to sleep his, his, to sleep his slumber undisturbed and who refuses to move if, if not at his own slow pace and who conducts himself similarly in other matters like these, it will surely be difficult for him to raise early to go to synagogue for prayer in the morning, uh, or to cut his meal short because it is time for afternoon mencha prayer, or to leave his house for the purpose of performing a mitzvah if the weather is not uh, perfectly clear, and all the more will such an individual find it difficult to rush himself to perform mitzvot or to engage in Torah study, what we just said. So this is the type of person that, um, w when you have kids, you'll, you, you'll know what I'm talking about. You'll ask them to do something. They go, okay, I'll get to it in a minute. Just a minute, I'll get to it in a minute. And then when you say, well, why didn't you do it? They say, it was raining outside. I was going to, right? I couldn't get the back door unlocked. Couldn't find the key, right? Always an excuse. Do we not become uh, experts at, at giving excuses to Hashem why we don't do things? So what he's saying is Zerizus will never even be developed without the proper perspective of what energizing your life to get up and do something. A person um, who, who makes himself uh, attentive, and busy, God begins to do something really unique for them and inspires them. I really do believe that if we're left to our, our, uh, our natural inclination, it wouldn't be this. If we're left to our natural inclination, we, who would study? I mean, why would you want to have to think about going to bed and so tired that you want to pray? I mean, why would you want to do that? Right. Well, he does that to all of us, but at the same time, he doesn't do it beyond, he doesn't force us our will, right? He inspires our will, because our will ultimately is to be that way. We want to, re I mean, deep down inside, our Yetzer Tov wants that. It really wants to be righteous and wants to do better, and that's why he inspires us as he sees us developing watchfulness, or Zerizus, he then begins to inspire and give us the opportunity. It's what, what we need once we get the watchfulness and the da'at, the knowledge of Hashem, then we have to have the zeal. And the zeal comes from, you can't have one without the other, just bottom line. The bottom line, our watchfulness to study Torah and to pray and to do mitzvot and to give tzedakah, that inspires zeal. Uh, the, we have... 
we have parallels in the physical world all the time. Uh, if uh, if you if you're active, you have more energy to be more active. Bottom line. If we are not active and we lay around the house, we don't have the energy to get up and do anything. I mean, bottom line, it's just it, it's in the physical world. This is what it is in the spiritual world. So, our we have to learn to match our uh, the, our physical activity and pair it up to what we're doing in, in the spiritual. It's prioritizing. It's prioritizing. Right. We're creatures of habit too, and so right. if your habit is and was to be the lazy thing in habit, that was your norm at that time. Right. So the zeal and myth that you develop is going to give you a new habit. Right. To follow, and then when it becomes a habit, it's not as hard. Oh no, but it's it not as hard. It takes time. Yeah. It takes time. One of the things that we, how long does it take to, to develop a habit? If you can commit to 21 days of at least your consistency in your prayer life and the study of Torah or listen to lectures, it gets so easy after that. It's just you won't, and, and what's funny is it doesn't take you 21 days to fall out of that either. Okay, two or three days and you're back on the skids again. Now, Brook Hashem, it's not like we are, we're falling down and hitting the bottom and starting square one again or zero. Uh, this is about the constant battle back and forth. We had this discussion this morning just before the class. It's funny how sometimes these discussions really t dovetail into our, and into our lecture. But, you know, why does Hassan, why is, he pun why is he not punished? And why are the people who make the bad decision punished for what they do? And we explain the whole idea is Hatzatan's role as a prosecuting attorney in heaven's court. He's the one that brings you up on charges. And if you didn't come up on charges, you would never do tshuva. You'd never know to do tshuva, right? So his job is to bring you up on charges. So when you've done something wrong and immediately you feel this, this guilt or this, you know, this shame for what you did, you were brought up on charges. So you admit your guilt, you do tshuva, and... Hasatan is doing his job. That's his job. He gets paid a lot of money to do that. So uh, that's a great thing. So we we learn to be buffeted by our failures and we grow. And that one of the major things that he says here in chapter nine is laziness or slothfulness. A little folding of the hands, remember? Okay. Um Furthermore, one who accustoms himself to such practices of being slothful is not his own master to act differently when he wants to. For his will has already become bound by the shackles of his habit, which becomes second nature. They're not unbreakable. But he has to break the shackles to do that. Ramchal describes the proper attitude that counters this obstacle of Zerizus. In truth, a person must know that he is not in this world for relaxation, but rather toil and effort. Adam was toiling in the garden before the curse. He had to mend the garden. He had to take care of it. But the difference was, is he will have to do this for the rest of his life. He will have to work hard by the sweat of his brow. And that's, that's what we're put on this earth for. And therefore, one should not conduct himself in his service of Hashem in any other way than the manner of workers working for their employer. In accordance to, uh, Rav Yochanan uh, would say, we are hired day laborers in the world. Furthermore, one should conduct himself in a manner of a soldier at their battle stations, whose meals are eaten in haste, whose sleep is, uh, is transient, who is always stand, uh, uh, always ready to, uh, to, in a moment to, to go into action. Regarding this, it is stated, for man is born to toil. While this may seem challenging, it can in fact be attained. How is it attained? By practice, by work. How do you train a soldier? One of the things that they learn in boot camp is, you know, you can't go to a soldier in boot camp and throw the whole nine yards on them, what they're going to get in 10 years' experience or even three years' experience. It could be overwhelming. 
So what they do is they train them in areas what we call zerizus, watchfulness, and uh, zerus, watchfulness and zerizus, zeal, by giving them tasks that are seem to be menial and mindless, right? For example, the way your boots are shined. Now, nowadays, I don't think they have to shine their boots, but the way your uniform looks. Uh, the next is how you line up in formation, how fast you line up in formation. And there are rigorous standards as to how they are to do that, and if they don't, they're immediately corrected and punished at some level, and group punishment sometimes even for the punishment for one person. But the idea, it seems, is when you're in basic training, they're mindless, stupid little games that they're playing. They're not playing games with them. What they're doing is they're training them to have watchfulness and zeal about their job. A soldier that never gets the, gets the zeal will never make it. Never make it in the military. Even if he makes it through basic training, it won't be long before he'll get washed out in the military because he just doesn't have enough snap, right? Enough bearing. And I really would think that that probably fits into most categories of jobs that I know of. Anybody worth their salt is going to have some snap about them and going to be able to get the job done. And so this, this is what we're talking about. Um, the sage's illustration of, of this sort of slothfulness or a, a laziness in the context of Torah study serves as a necessary model for ideal Torah observance as well. Internalizing this truth and living by it reduces a person's natural laziness, prepares him to serve Hashem with Zerizus. The Ramchal proceeds to address the second obstacle of Zerizus. Another one of the factors that detracts, so the first one was laziness, or slothfulness, that detracts from Zerizus. Excessive anxiety and great fear of the changing periods of time in which that they may be, they may bring, what time may bring. For if one does not free himself from these weaknesses, then sometimes we will be afraid of the cold or the heat, sometimes of the threat of accident, sometimes the possibility of illness, sometimes the wind, and so forth, and every factor like these and such fears will deter him from moving with zeal, with the strong passion to get it done, to seize the opportunity to perform the mitzvah. There is, um, I know in, in the careers that I've had in the past, the inability to get over fear uh, will get you killed. Okay? Your inability to make a decisive decision and go with a situation will get you killed. I remember one time having an officer, remember, uh, I can't. I'm trying to remember her name now. The real big, tall, huge officer. She was big. I mean, she was uh, she's scary, right? But a sweet. She was like a teddy bear. She was the sweetest thing, right? And uh, uh, she liked to be called Big Bird. Big Bird. That's, that was her her nickname. And one day, uh, she she just she's on the radio, and she just says, "Hey, can you check by with me, right?" And I, I was like, "Okay." I don't know what was going on, so. I drove over to the neighborhood where she was at, and she had a five-foot Hispanic male bent over backwards over her trunk by the throat, and she's rifling through his pockets. And I'm like, well, you didn't need my help, right? She goes, no, I did need my help because he, he tried to pull a knife on me, right? This was a person who didn't, didn't think twice. I mean, she just did her job. And at the same time, I've known people being in the same situation, second guess, or not really be alert to the situation and got themselves seriously hurt because of it. This is what the Ramchal is talking about. What is, uh, uh, what good is a person, a soldier or uh, a businessman? How can you imagine being a CEO of a company and you don't make the rightful decisions for your company because you're scared something's going to go wrong with your decision? One of the things that we learn, a good leader makes a decision. Whether it's bad or not, he makes a decision, he moves on it, right? Uh, the worst kind of leader is the kind of leader that, that says, well, I, I, man, I would have done it, but I didn't know, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. And we, we've known people like that. I've worked with people like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, like we, yeah, that too. 
So the whole point is, is fear is one of the tracks. So we have laziness or slothfulness, and we have excessive anxiety. This is the idea of that Shlomo HaMelech, peace be upon him, spoke about when he said, a lazy person says, there is a young lion on the path, a lion among the streets. So the whole idea is, I can't go that way. There's a lion out there. Or there might be a lion out there. Now let me ask you, is it possible to have fear about something you shouldn't have fear about when it comes to your uh, your the result of your mitzvah, right? Or the result of your study of Torah. It, let me say this. It is possible to be concerned that if I commit at this level, then I'm going to have to always do this. Right? right? And it's like, I can't do that. I remember someone coming to my class who said, um, I'm not coming back anymore because I'm going to have to be responsible for what I hear. Right? Yeah. That's the, that's the example this person is fully capable and understood, but say, yeah, I don't want to know anymore because that's going to make me responsible. Likewise, the sages of blessed memory have already uh, denigrated this trait of excessive fear and attributed it to sinners, and Scripture supports them, as it says, sinners are afraid in Zion, trembling seized hypocrites. To the extent that one of the great Talmudic sages told his disciple when he saw that he was fearful and lacked faith in Hashem, you are a sinner. You don't really get around that. The idea is anxiety is the, is, is the worst kind of lack of trust in God. I mean, it's the worst kind. I mean, you, your anxiety. I mean, look at the great prophet. He, he did, what did you say, though? It's almost premeditated. Well, I wonder some, right. But I wonder, I agree, there, there is a legitimate anxiety, okay, don't, I'm not getting me, don't get me wrong. You know, something happens, you go, oh, you, you, you're fearing what's, what the result's going to be. I wonder, though, if, if, if laziness or slothfulness is the impetus for anxiety, right? It's like induced anxiety. Precisely. One of the two. One of the, yeah, absolutely. So you have a person who's like, yeah, they're slothful and lazy, so they start coming up with, well, I'm not really sure if I do this, that this is going to happen, or, you know, I could go to Torah study today, but, you know, it's sunny outside and I need to get things done, whatever it may be, right? You come up with anxiety-induced deals, and I'm not really sure. There are those people, do what? Right, right. But the biggest thing is why do they have anxiety? Because they're having to get out of their comfort zone. They have to get off of their, their comfort wagon, right? Um, the remedy to fear and anxiety, rather concerning this, is, is stated in Tehillim 37.3 or Psalms 37.3. Uh, Trust in Hashem and do good. We said this last night. Trust in Hashem and do good. Dwell in the land and nourish yourself with faith, which means trust that Hashem will protect you and provide for you then you will not be afraid to do good. By cultivating one's trust in Hashem, a person banishes the fears that prevent him from performing his commandments. Now, after walking with Hashem for some time, we discover some very valuable lessons. Usually when difficult things come into your life, it's for the very purpose that something good is getting ready to happen for you. And we just pretty much know it. When... When it seems like you just can't get the two pieces of your daily life puzzles to match because this is off kilter, that's off kilter, this is not working, we're not able to get it connected, we pretty much know that when that happens, that is sort of the, the um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a system of excuses so that you cannot follow through or for it to not work or you develop the wrong attitude about it, whatever it may be, right? Uh, it's so easy to, to do that. Uh, I was talking to someone uh, the other day. We tried for three weeks to get a hold of each other. He's in Israel. I'm here. It's hard, right? And finally, when I talked to him, he says, I knew that Hashem has some reason that we're going to work together 
because we couldn't get together for three weeks. I mean, we're just missing each other by minutes. He would text me, hey, I'm available now. I'm like, I'm not available now, right? It was this, so we pretty much know that it seems that there's this buffet, buffer that constantly takes, takes place. It's going to give us the excuse. But the remedy to this, this anxiety is trusting Hashem that it's all going to work out. He has a plan. It's, it is a test. It is a test. Absolutely, and that's the whole point. It's, it's, I know Hashem's got it all worked out. Right. Let me tell you that, and I've only recently learned this. So I wish I could have said I've had this for years, but I haven't. I've only recently learned it doesn't matter. Whatever Hashem's going to do, He's going to do. And He'll work it out. He'll figure it out. And I get to not worry about it. <laughs> because worrying about it ties my time up. It ties my mind up, and I can't, I can't think about it. You just can't. Okay, could you imagine how would a soldier go to war if he has to worry about the things the Pentagon has to take care of? He would never do it. How would he ever march into battle thinking, how am I going to eat? Where am I going to get my bullets from? Where am I going to get my resupply? Where am I going to take a shower? But he does have to trust in his government. He has to trust in his government. That's the whole point. Jimmy, and that's where I think we've been failing. That's where we've been what, what you talking about as as faith pe people as of faith? A, yeah, no, I'm talking about the USA. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, so, yeah. So it's kind of based on you know the trust. Issue. No, it is based on the trust. Absolutely, 100 percent based on the trust issue. And when we look at our our faith walk with Hashem, if we are worrying about our life, what is coming, what is going, what is happening, if we worry about that, we really are not trusting Hashem. Now. There's nothing wrong, so, you know, listen, we all have built-in mechanisms of fight and flight, right? And that's just normal. But we have to be aware that there is a level in which it becomes pathological and it's not healthy, and we're not trusting the shoe. There's nothing wrong with saying, I really hope this shoe doesn't drop because it's going to be tough, right? But the other side of that is, I'm just going to trust the show. I think women are more considered than men sometimes. I think as being that mother. And no, I agree. I totally agree. I totally agree. It's a hard thing to get over. And especially when it has to do with her children. Absolutely. Right. 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 Absolutely. You think about this. What man or woman can add one inch to their height? So the whole point is, is what, what's, what's the point? I've never known worry and anxiety to ever fix a single thing, ever. But he's working on us, and the things that happen to us and the things that come our way are intended to uh, somehow uh, uh, affect us. Absolutely. Right. Right. So the idea is we all know when we have anxiety. So that's part of the test is what are you going to do with it when it comes? It's not that you don't have it. It's what are you going to do with it when it comes? It's we all have moments that we just like, oh, I can't believe this is happening right now. But it's what I'm going to do after it. So a summary of how huh? or doing exactly. So a summary on how to avoid the two do the obstacles to Zerizus which is laziness and fear. The sum of the matter is a person needs to make himself incidental in his involvement in the material world. Do we understand what incidental? What is that? Right. When we, when we eat, uh, once again, we, ego is the impetus for sin, right? Ego is, is an impetus also for this laziness. I want it my way. I want to do what I want. Ego says, and narcissism says, uh, I'm going to develop all these anxieties because the world isn't working the way I want it to work. And I, I have said this often. It says, you know, there are people out there that feel like that their whole world would be perfect if everybody would be like them, right? But it's not. <clears throat> and firmly affixed in this involvement in his service for the shim. So the idea is to, re is to take the material world and realize I'm just a, I'm a speck in this material world 
Hashem is the, is the universe, and I trust Him. So my, my full focus in this material world is to be in service of Hashem. That's it. To this end, we should be satisfied and content as far as all the worldly matters are concerned and whatever presents itself uh, to him and should take from what comes to his hand rather than seeking to acquire more. And at the same time, he should be distanced from leisure, but close to work and toil. And finally, his heart should be firm, confident in trust of Hashem, and he will therefore not fear the unexpected conditions and misfortunes that come uh, inevitably with him. <clears throat> Having advocated an approach of confidence <clears throat> and faith in overcoming one's natural fears for the sake of performing mitzvah, Ramchal now questions whether it is proper. Here we go. Perhaps you will say that a person should not be confident and not be bold when it comes to mitzvah performance. Why? We find that the sages require, in all circumstances, that a person protect himself with great vigilance and not place himself in danger. Even if he is righteous and a man has a, 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 and a man of good deeds, a, a man of good deeds. Furthermore, the sages of blessed memory have pointed out all misfortune is in the hand of heaven except for sickness brought on by overexposure to cold and heat. So let's, let's take it this way. <clears throat> you know, we can say, oh, we trust Hashem, I have no anxiety, but you can also be an idiot and walk out in traffic. Yeah. Right? So that's, I mean, I had to translate to 21st century terminology. <laughs> that's what it's talking about. Oh, I live by faith. That's like the snake charmers. Oh, the snake ain't going to bite you. Right, it's not going to bite me. Right, it's, yeah, it's the Good snake charmer. So th there, there is a fine line between having trust in Hashem and being slothful and putting that off as saying, well, I just, I trust God. He'll do whatever I, you know, he's going to take care of. I know that I have a big lump on the side of my neck and the doctor's telling me I need to get a biopsy, but I'm not going to do it because I'm going to trust Hashem. Well, if you die of cancer, okay, well, you trusted Hashem and he decided to kill you with cancer. <laughs> I mean, if that's where you're going to take it, but the whole point is, why, why get ill over the misfortune of not getting out of the cold? So, you, we're, we're following, you're tracking me, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, personal responsibility. Here's, here's the greatest example. Tzedakah. Okay. We have a Tzedakah box for the uh, Hanukkah. Um, deal for the prisoners, Jewish prisoners. I get my next paycheck and I put the whole thing in there. And then I want to say, I trust Hashem. Oh yeah, it's not that much, sister, trust me. But I'm going to put my whole paycheck in there and God will pay for my house, my note, and take care of my medical costs, whatever else is out there. I mean, that all sounds great and fine, but the practicality is if, I'm, if I have an a, a, a eviction notice because of a mitzvah, what have I really accomplished and am I really trusting the Shem or did I create the environment that's hurt me? Right, so that's, that's what we're talking about. So ego, isn't that like an ego thing? Oh, yeah, I guess it could be in a way. But the whole point, there are people out there that do those kinds of things. They, they do, and it's you got to watch. You got to watch it, so you got to think it out exactly. In the scripture in Deuteronomy four fifteen, it says, "You shall greatly beware of your souls," which means that one must guard himself or herself well from danger. You got to be careful at how you approach things. And we've, we've said this over and over, but I think it, it, it is justified to say it again. We're reminded by the great sages to, to not have so much zeal that you do something that, that, that hurts you or that hurts your family. Uh, there are people who decide to become observant and they wreck all their family. They wreck everybody around them because of their observance. And it's important to be as smart 
about how you're doing it and have wisdom about what you're doing. Be aware of yourself. Moreover, the sages said there in another uh, Gemara that in a situation where danger is common, one may not invoke such trust, even for the matter of performing a mitzvah. Do you, you, you understand what we're talking about now? So even if the matter of a mitzvah, if this is going to harm you or to harm your family, you really need to reconsider what this, what this is. is it, you follow. How are these sources to be resolved with the sources stated above that advocate trust in Hashem to promote fulfillment of mitzvah? Now here we have the sticky, wicky, sticky, sticky wicked that we're talking about. How do you say, I must have great imuna and trust with the kohen and Hashem to do greater mitzvahs? So I pray, Hashem, give me the opportunity to do mitzvahs, more mitzvahs. And yet, I see an opportunity to do a mitzvah, and then I measure it to see, is this going to harm me or help me? And here's the balance. So this idea of justified and unjustified fear. Okay, we're going to talk about this. We talked about not having anxiety, and you're saying, well, the Ramchal is telling us that, we, that fear and anxiety is an uh, uh, impediment to developing Zero Zeus. But now you're telling me, watch your soul. Be careful for your soul, because what if you, in the, in the, in the desire to do a mitzvah, you bring harm to yourself or to someone else? I'm going to do a great mitzvah. I'm going to give money to a poor person. But I don't realize that this poor person has a horrible drug problem. And I give them $3,000 and they die of a drug overdose. Have I helped them? I haven't helped them at all. So we've got, so how do we justify to fear or not to fear, not to have anxiety over a situation? This is not about having anxiety over a mitzvah. It's about having watchfulness in your mitzvah. Right? So here we go. Right, yeah, absolutely. You've got to be very careful about how you're doing it. It's, it's important. So the idea he brings down is justified or unjustified fear. You should know that there is one kind of fear and there is another kind of fear. Two kinds of fear. Similarly, appropriate fear, and there is foolish fear, right? Similarly, there is trust and there is foolhardiness. Have you been around someone that didn't know fear? or they were foolish. They just didn't know danger, and they would do the stupidest things. And you would see it happening, and you realize this is going to end in disaster. Not good. And that is foolhardiness. When you look, some of the things that you see on TV, like, you know, you know world's dumbest criminals or activities or whatever they do, you see, as soon as you see the guy on top of the roof of his house with four foot of snow on it, and he's going to break it loose by jumping on it, Nothing good's going to come out of that, right? And you know, I have a grandson like that. Do you have a grandson? On top, yeah. I got a grandson that's barely just walking, and he gets up on the arm of the couch and dives off, knowing his dad's going to catch him. Exactly. And then when his dad's not around, he dives onto the couch, and half the time he bounces and hits the floor. I know. And he gets up, and he's like, ah. Ah, and he's all right. <laughs> it's, fun, it's funny because my oldest son just is looking at him one day. We're all sitting around, and he's just out of control doing the wildest stuff, standing on toys that move. You, you know he's going to fall on himself. My eldest son just looks at me and goes, well, we just hope that he makes it to trade school. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, so anyway. But again, that's his humor. He was not speaking negative over my son, grandson. Yeah, for, for behold, the master, blessed be he, made man a being with ac accurate intelligence and straightforward reasoning, so that he may conduct himself in a good way and protect himself from the harmful things that were created to punish the wicked. Now, if someone decides not to conduct himself in the path of wisdom and instead abandons himself to danger, this is not trust in Hashem, but it is foolishness. We get that, right? Moreover, 
He is sinning by going against the will of the Creator. Blessed be His name. So the guy who stands on the rooftop of a building and he says that God can do anything and I'm going to jump off is a fool. Can I read this one? Yes, please, please. It says such a person is sinning by uh, flouting the will of the Creator. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very good. Man to protect himself. Right. He wants man to protect himself. So uh, a lot, you know, we, we've all been through this circumstance where we want to know, you know, is it Hashem's will for me to do this or that? What does He want me to do? I mean, how can I know what God wants me to do in this situation? And one of the things we have to remind ourselves, He gave us uh, gray matter and He gave us the Torah, and you're responsible for making the right decision, period. That's your responsibility. He wants you to make the right decision. Yes, ma'am. Justified anxiety and fear is um, the whole example of the um, giving of charity to someone who's poor. I'm concerned that if I give this person this charity, they're going to take out and they're, they're going to abuse themselves more or they gamble it away. They're not really going to take care of their family. I've got, that's a justified fear. I'm not sure that this is going to help them and therefore I'm not sure that I should give tzedakah in this way or give it at all. Because it's just as bad to, to give tzedakah to somebody who's going to abuse it for the wrong reason than it is to just not give charity at all. So the, it's, it's, it's important to make sure we know what we're doing. So that's the sort of justified anxiety. Um, so wisdom would be to think of your tzedakah as your friend. Correct. Instead of being so like you're, he's out there and you don't know what he is, sometimes you just bring him food or sometimes Correct. you whatever you need. Correct. You bring food to the so children. Oh, right, right, right. Think. Absolutely. So that is a justified anxiety. This kind of justified justified anxiety doesn't freeze us, doesn't cause us to go, ah, I'm not doing anything. That's unjustified anxiety. Justified goes, okay, I've got it. There's got to be a workaround. Get creative. Get creative. So here, here's the statement. Be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. So when the anxiety comes, be a part of the solution. Just think about, okay, what do I need to do? I'm not really sure. There's got to be a workaround. But the worst thing we can do is freeze and say, well, I'll just trust God. He'll take care of them. Or be well. <laughs> I'll pray for you. No, there's a workaround. There's a way to, to deal with it. Um, it is thus uh, emerges that Aside from innate danger of the harmful thing to which he is now susceptible because of his lack of precaution, he, is, he, is, he also is guilty of actively forfeiting his life through the sin that he transgresses by putting himself in mortal danger, such that the sin is not being cautious itself leads him to be punished now, this type of precaution is about protecting himself from genuine danger. And this type of concern for one's safety, which is based on the guidance of wisdom and intellect, is the appropriate precaution and concern. For about this, it is stated, a clever person seeks pearls and hides, but fools go on and are punished. But on the other hand, the foolish type of concern is that a person should want to add precautions upon precautions, and fear upon fear, and to make the, a safeguard upon its safeguard in a way that leads to neglect of the Torah and divine service. We understand. Going back to this clever person sees the pearls and hides, but fools go on and are punished. The idea is that we seize upon the opportunity to do a righteous act. And once we see that opportunity is there, we do it, we make sure we execute it, but at the same time, a person who becomes paralyzed in their inability, they question God too much. 
right? Well, I'm not sure. Is this a mitzvah? It's not a mitzvah. Should I do this? Should I not do this? Should I go on? This is that's that's unjustified anxiety, right? That's un, that's not even watchfulness. Does that make sense? A person like, oh, I'm not really sure if I do this. I do that. I can't do this. It, you you got to back off and say, look, this is what the Torah says. I have the physical abilities to do it. Therefore, I should do it. I trust Hashem. But a fool goes out and does does things that he shouldn't do. For example. Uh, selling everything you have and leaving your spouse and moving to Israel. That's foolish. You lose your family, everything. That would be fun. Then you don't even get into Israel, right? Because you're, you don't meet their standard, right? So the whole point is, is you, got, you have to be a, 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 guy, a, wise, a wise guy. <laughs> um, the Remchal, say again. And what are we doing? You're a wise guy. The Ramachal explains how to distinguish between concern that is appropriate and anxiety that is inappropriate. So really when we talk about justified and unjustified fear, we're actually talking about appropriate and inappropriate concern. What's appropriate, what's inappropriate? Can you give me an inappropriate concern? Can you think of anything? Anything inappropriate? How about an appropriate concern? Okay. I'm not going to fly. I'm not ever going to fly because the plane's a plane crashes. That's an inappropriate concern. Here, I'm not going to, if I was going to, I'm not going to fly because God would have given me wings or something like that. Okay, that's People a good used one. To say that all the time. I think you know, I've I don't heard. I don't want to get in a plane because if He wanted me to fly, He would have given me wings. I think my wife has actually said that, haven't you? No, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> No, no, my my poor wife flies, and she doesn't have inappropriate concerns, but flying is is a concern. is a concern for her. There, there are plane crashes, so in a way, right? But more people die. Yeah, yeah, more people die of flu than yeah, car do. accidents or plane accidents. <laughs> right, absolutely. It's like being on a roller coaster. Exactly. Of course, when I get on a plane, I sing the song "Roller Coaster." Mm. Remember that song? Y'all don't remember that. Too old? Is that what you're saying? Too young? I haven't heard it either. You don't remember that song? And I'm older than you, and I haven't heard it. I haven't heard that song. Maybe it's something Have you heard it? And she's way older than you. It's because that was my generation. You weren't in my generation. Yes, that's true. We're really off target. Anyway, let's get back on tag. The rule in which to discern between these types of fear is, uh, is the distinction that the sages of blessed memory made when they said a place where harm is likely to occur is different from the place where it is not. The sages thus teaches that in a place where danger is common and known to exist, one must take precautions. Pretty common sense stuff, right? Regarding similar case cases, it is said, we do not assume a disqualifying circumstance that we do not see. Don't count the chickens before the eggs hatch. What are the other euphemisms that we use? That's a good one. We don't know. We'll worry about it when it comes. That's been my wife and I's mantra for years after learning some lessons in life. You just learn there's nothing we can do about it. So for us to sit here and think about what potential threats are there, <clears throat> it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. Why not let's just worry about it when it comes? And I would say that majority of the time, that never happens. Nothing ever really bad happens of it. Just, it's, it's dangerous. The sages teach a place uh, where a danger is common and known to exist. One must place precautions. But in a place, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry, we said that. Regarding a similar case, it is said, we do not assume a disqualifying circumstances that we do not see. The sages who resolve halakhic requ- uh, queries uh, relies only on what they see. This itself is the idea expressed in the verse that we cited above. A clever person sees pearls and hides. Note that the verse speaks only about hiding from a, I'm sorry, pearl, peril that one actually sees not about hiding from something that merely might be possibly coming down the pike. 
A good example of this is preppers. Right? We all preppers. Have you heard the term preppers? Yeah. They used to have a show called Preppers. TV. Uh, doomsday, yeah, doomsday preppers. These are people that have spent hundreds of thousands of personal family budget to have underground shelters and armor vest and weapons and storages of food. All that's, you know, at some level, we all need to be at least a little prepared for hurricanes and things like that. But what we see with these people is pathological. It's like it's crazy. Their whole life is enveloped. So their whole life is enveloped in unjustified fear. Right? Now, let's take it. Let's see what foolhardiness is. So that's unjustified fear. And let's look at what foolhardiness is. Foolhardiness says, well, I trust God, so, so I'm not going to ever be prepared. I'm not going to get extra oil and gas in my car when the hurricane comes. I'm not going to board up the windows because I trust Hashem. I'm not going to get extra food in my cabinets when the hurricane comes because I trust Hashem. That's foolhardiness. Now we see the, the, the contrast between the two. Yeah, absolutely. You have to be prepared. And I, I love to be prepared. I, I'm going to try to zip. Can we go ahead and try to zip on through this rest of this chapter? Because I don't want to. Right, right, right. Um, this kind of ill-advised hiding uh, from perils uh, that need not to be expected is exactly the idea expressed in the verse that, uh, that was mentioned before from the Ramchal. And it says, a lazy person says there's a young lion on the path a lion among the streets. One who hides from such danger will be, in, uh, be inhibited by his worries from performing any mitzvahs. The Remchal cites a midrash to illustrate this point. Our sages of blessed memory explain the concept in the form of a story to demonstrate how far the rational fear can reach to prevent a person performing a good deed. Shlomo HaMelech said seven things about a lazy person. Number one, they tell the lazy one, your teacher is in such a such a city. Go and learn Torah from him. And he answers them, I'm afraid of the lion in the road. I would go. I'm really eager to learn from my teacher. But, the big but. Number two, they say your teacher is in the province. And he replies, yes, I'm afraid to walk in that neighborhood. At least there be a lion in the streets. They tell him, your teacher is living near your home. And he replies, there might be a lion outside my door. They say, the teacher is in your house. And he says, if I go to him, I will find the door locked and I'll have to come back here, etc., etc. The Midrash continues, number five, they say to him, the door is open. Having nothing else to say, he concedes. Whether it's opened or whether it's locked, I want to sleep a little bit more. It's not about the lion. I want to take a nap. When he finally awakens, they place food before him, but he's too lazy to put the food in his mouth. Finally, he fails, falls before them, but he's too lazy to put the food in his mouth. Since he fails to study Torah in his youth, he will not be able to grow older even if he wants to in time, he's just too lazy to progress at all. Thus, you'll learn from the illustration of a lazy person's rationalization, that is, not fear that causes him to be lazy, rather it is lazy that his laziness has caused him to be fearful. So as I said before, I said, I wonder if fear is a result of laziness or laziness a result of fear. Well, we understand that fear is actually the result of laziness. Because you come up with excuses, right? The Ramachal notes that not one, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Ramachal notes that one need not resort to scriptural or rabbinic teachings to derive from the lessons taught above. This is just a practical idea that we see in life. Regardless of all these matters that the Ramachal has discussed in the chapter, namely that the greatest obstacles to Zerazus are indulgence in material comforts and excessive anxiety about the risk associated with performing good deeds. 
daily experience is a test to them. Their truth can be seen by observing the conduct that is widespread and common amongst the masses, as this is their way brought on by their folly. One who studies the matter intellectually will find it will be absolutely true. Wisdom will come easy to the perceptive one. And, of course, one who's not perceptive. Wisdom is, is an enigma. The Ramchal concludes this discussion of Zerazus this way. The topic of Zerazus is, uh, has now been clarified with an, an uh, with a elucidated concept that goes this way. I think is sufficient to inspire the heart and mind, according to the Ramchal says, the wise one will utilize this to become wiser and further increase in, in his acquisition of these concepts. Ramchal closes the chapter of Zerus with the observation on the relationship between this trait and Zeri, 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 Zerus. I'm sorry. Now you see that it is fitting for Zerus to be the level that follows Zerus. The idea is that one needs the other, for generally a person will not be a, uh, a one who practices Zerus, Zerus. He won't be zealous unless he first has the element of watchfulness. This is because someone who does not focus his attention on being careful with his actions and on contemplating the importance of divine service as its requirements, which is definition of the trait of Zerius, has, as I have previous, or as Ramchal previously wrote, uh, will find it difficult to ele uh, elevate himself in love and passion for the service of Hashem and to act eagerly with this level of attention to detail before his creator. For he is still mired in his physical desires. And it is still racing along the course of this rigorous routine that distance him from uh, all of this. However, once one has already opened his eyes to scrutinize his actions and be careful of them, and has already made an account for the gain and losses resulting from the performance of the commandments, and conversely by uh, committing transgressions, he mentions uh, he mentioned in our description of Zerizus, it is easy for it will be easy for him to turn away from evil and to yearn for good, to yearn for righteousness. So, in conclusion, what detracts from our zeal? Let's let's enumerate them: laziness and fear. Within laziness and fear, is we have to realize that there is good fear and healthy fear and bad fear. And within that, we have to keep it balanced. But we, there is a difference between the justified and unjustified fear. But in the whole sum of it, we realize that a person who has a pathological level of fear to do mitzvah and to do the things of God really is just lazy. I mean, we went through this whole thing just to say a lazy person can become a sinner is a sinner, in essence. If you fail to do the mitzvah when you know you need to do them, you fail to do it because you have all the excuses in the world, well, this is not the way we used to do it, this is not how my mother did it, uh, you know, it's not the right time, whatever it may be, it's a result of being slothful. I can't get up and study because I'm really tired and I want to stay in bed. Make sense? Just be honest with yourself. I was, had a friend of mine, my wife and I know very well, He's now passed on a blessed memory. Love to smoke. Smoke, good Lord. Um, several packs a day. I remember when they were standing outside and smoking a cigarette. I was like, I hate these things. And I went, look, be honest with yourself. If you hated them, you wouldn't smoke them because you do what you like. I said, just be honest and say, I love these things. Why do you say I hate these things? The idea is that don't, don't claim one thing and do another. Right? Just be honest before Hashem. Hashem, you know, I'm having a difficult time doing these mitzvahs because I have un unchecked fears. Or 
take, you know, taking a step? What's it going to require of me? You know, once I start it, can I finish it? Because I don't want to start something I can't finish. I've, that's a big famous one we all have to deal with. Why would I want to start doing that observance if I can't really complete it? Uh, I, I, I can't do this because I'm not capable at this time, whatever it may be. That is when we have to be honest with Hashem and cry out to Him. And, and, and Hamash, like really, like with serious seriousness, God, cry out to Hashem and say, you've got to help me. I'm, I'm lazy. I want to do these things, but I'm lazy. I can't do them. You have to help me. Give me the energy. I'm going to get up and get my baby carriage. Do you remember the story I told last night? So the idea is, how can that couple have a baby and we didn't have a baby? But they went and got a baby carriage. So how am I going to get more zeal? Get off my fanny and get some activity. Do one mitzvah. One. Just do one regularly. One. That's it. Don't worry about trying to do 613. Just do one. Love God with your heart. That's the big one. If you could do that, the rest comes easy. The rest is embodied in that. So just start off falling in love with the creator of the universe. And pleasing him, that's it. Everything else sort of falls in place after that. That concludes the class. We will start chapter 10 next Thursday.